My name is Dane Wigington, Geoengineering Watchdog of our site. I think a lot of you are familiar with that. This is not a job I wanted. It's simply something I felt had to be done once I became aware of what was happening in the skies above our heads. A lot of people are trying to ignore this issue right now. Based on how fast things are unraveling, they will not be able to ignore things for much longer. The point of this presentation today, denial, deception, the last chance for life on Earth, for many that might sound very alarmist and very theatrical. It's not. It's not. If you we look at hard data right now, it is astounding how quickly things are unfolding and we are not being told. So I'll, I'll elaborate further as we go into the presentation. As we see aircraft like this, normal condensation trails do not immediately emit from the back of an aircraft, and certainly they're not plumes like that. There's a cooling zone between the back of an aircraft and a normal condensation trail, and the high bypass turbofan jet engine by design is not conducive to producing such trails. So again, when we have trails like that, we know that that's not condensation. You can't slice a bit out of the middle of a trail. This film footage here is very compelling. It's from a site called Tanker Enemy in Italy. If you look closely, there are two jets there, not one. They're AWAC tankers. One turns off. Keep watching. It gets more compelling. And this is where the argument ends. People ask, how do you prove this? How can I prove it to someone who doesn't want to listen? We have film footage of them spraying, period. You can see the other aircraft there. See the wing and the plume? Keep watching. This is how we prove it, because we have film footage of these aircraft spraying at altitude, period, end of the argument. It's over. Now, anybody who says that's a condensation trail is simply in another reality. It's not condensation. We know this, this is happening. It's the biggest elephant in the room right now. It's the biggest untold story on the planet. Words from a dying planet. Is our planet dying? Yes. Our planet's absolutely dying, very rapidly. And there's a great deal of things fueling the fire. I chose this issue because it's simply the largest single assault on all life on Earth, bar none. There's, there's a lot of challenges we face, but climate engineering is quantitatively doing the most damage of all. Earth threatened with sixth mass extinction. We are in the sixth great mass extinction now, today. This is a statistical fact. It's not projection, it's not theory. We're losing some 200 species a day of plant and animal right now. That's 10,000 times background extinction rate. Now, a lot of people in the anti-climate engineering movement want to believe that there's nothing wrong with the planet, there's no warming, it's all a hoax, it's only the spraying. This is simply not true. Too many people want to think dichotomously it's either a this or that equation. That's not reality. There's, there's so many sources of anthropogenic damage to the planet, one could never quantify it. Climate engineering, again, I believe is the largest single cause, but we put almost, I believe the latest figure is 100 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every single day. And anyone who thinks that's not a problem is not clear about reality. Climate engineering, again, is making a very bad situation exponentially worse, but it is by no means the only thing affecting the climate. That's, that's about, uh, I think we're 30 plus billion tons a year of CO2. Three years since Fukushima nuclear power road, road to our extinction. Could Fukushima end life on Earth? Yes, it could. Right now, that situation is completely out of control. Hot, again, I'm, I'm pointing out more forms of anthropogenic damage to the planet, and Fukushima certainly is. How is aerosol geoengineering making that worse? Aerosol geoengineering can migrate moisture a lot farther than it would have otherwise migrated. That could in theory, migrate some of the fallout from Fukushima farther over the continental US. So again, all things are tied together, but I'm pointing out that there's a great many forms of anthropogenic damage to our planet. Now, anybody that thinks that's normal or that that's commercial traffic, uh, again, needs to rethink their reality. Nothing normal about that. We know this. We know this over Shasta County. We have east-west massive spray plumes, and we have no east-west traffic ever. We have. 10 times the amount of aircraft in the air, literally, on days when we see that in our skies. So again, there's no, no speculation. We have film of this going on. Uh, this, this man I felt was very touching, and because people around the world are being harmed horrifically from a lack of rain. And we know the aerosols cause this lack of rain. The science is extremely clear on this. When you aerosolize the atmosphere, too many condensation nuclei affects the hydrological cycle radically. 
That rain that doesn't fall in one place tends to migrate somewhere else and come down in a deluge. We see this as well. Uh, we, we have the drought and deluge cycle intensifying around the globe. And a lot of causes for this, again, I'm not saying climate engineering is the only cause for a disrupted hydrological cycle by any means. But in fact, if we look mathematically, it appears to be the single greatest cause for a disruption in the hydrological cycle. Around the globe, I don't know if any of you have seen in Bosnia, Serbia, we've had massive, massive flooding. Also China, which not even the Chinese news is covering, 25,000 homes just wiped out. And the Chinese news isn't even covering this. Again, they're trying, trying to uh, hide this issue as much as they can. Uh, that's the sort of planet we're heading for, again, as, as the hydrological cycle is disrupted, ozone layer is shredded. Uh, we, we are on track for something now called Venus Syndrome. I'll elaborate on that in a while. This is a picture from Bosnia. This just happened. Now, the Bosnian people, I can tell you this and have contacts there. They believe that they are the victims of weather warfare. They absolutely believe this. They have, they have uh, ionosphere heater installations in Bosnia and Serbia that they know of now. The people are quite aware there. So when you have ionosphere heaters, whose purpose is, appears to be to manipulate weather patterns in the jet stream, why would they not think this? And they were, they've been hit with absolutely unprecedented flooding. People who think this isn't going on, this is all fringe, and, and, and certainly our society's been trained to think that anything that's not the official narrative is fringe. We have record of John F. Kennedy talking about weather control in 1961. We shall propose further cooperative efforts between all the nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. 53 years ago, this is historical record, historical fact. We have, I have an 80-page document from the NASA archives outlining the U.S. weather mod programs as of 1966 with budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars for anybody to look at. Media chooses not to. Weather is a force multiplier. Many of you have heard of this document, but this is a research paper outlining the, the U.S. military's goal to, quote, own the weather, period, as a force multiplier. Weather warfare has always been sought after by the militaries. Now, to, to try to quantify how fast the planet's warming, again, there's no debate. The reality is what it is, and, and no matter what argument anybody presents, those are the facts, period. It's not about liking Al Gore. It's not about wanting carbon credits. It's about reality. The planet's warming at absolutely unprecedented speed, equivalent to four Hiroshi, Hiroshima bombs every second. That's about 400,000 a day. Try, try to get your arms around how fast the planet's warming. It's, it's, it's difficult to, but that's statistical fact. Now, everybody remembers the polar vortex. And this is, this is an image from January 6th. And you see the cold zone pressed down into just those areas. And we've seen jet stream patterns that are absolutely unprecedented. You have the meteorological community scratching their heads about this. But when we have enough data to know that the ionosphere heaters can, in fact, heat the ionosphere, and that can, in fact, steer the jet stream, why would we think this is not going on? And, and, and the people in the east think it's the, that the whole world is cold. You can see the whole world is not cold. You have a very cold zone in the eastern U.S., and I think that was part of the plan to, to skew media in that direction. Now, these are temperature graphs. This is from the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. It's a group of scientists that are sounding the alarm. And you must sift the baby from the bathwater, because although the Arctic Methane Emergency Group data is accurate, they're calling for geoengineering, many of them, as if it hasn't been going on for 60 years already. Everyone has to learn to sift the baby from the bathwater, but that doesn't mean that their data and their projections are not accurate because they appear to be some of the most accurate. And what this shows is we could be looking at a, a six, seven degree C temperature rise by 2030. And right now what we see, every place we monitor, we're seeing an underreporting of temperatures, three, four, five degrees lower than the actual temperature on the ground. So it appears already it's much harder than we're being told. Now, this is Arctic ice breakup. I want you to look at the sky because it appears that they've been geoengineering heavily over the poles for probably as much as six decades. We have studies even from Stanford from the 50s talking about an Arctic haze and metallic particles detected, and they could not determine where those particles were coming from. Does the left hand not know what the right hand is doing? And, and we know these programs were going on back that far. We have patents for chemical ice nucleation assigned to the US military going back to 1950. So when we have skies like that, uh, we see the same thing here now, aerosolization. <clears throat> Why would they do this over the poles? Because we're losing Earth's albedo. The ice on both poles is the regulating mechanism for the planet, period. Ice reflects about 90% of the sun's incoming thermal energy. Seawater absorbs 90 plus percent, 93 percent according to this chart. So once we lose the ice, the ocean heats exponentially faster. As the oceans heat, 
methane hydrate is releasing from the sea floor. It's happening now. The East Lapteb Sea in the Arctic is moving closer to a methane geyser. In fact, it's there already. Uh, so the more ice we lose, the more the water heats, the more methane releases, which is covering the planet like a layer of glass. Methane is 100 times more potent than CO2 over a 10-year time horizon. You'll always hear the scientific community referring to it as being 20 times more potent. That's over a 100-year time horizon. We're looking at much, much uh, more immediate time frames. So methane escape could seal the fate of life on Earth if enough methane gets out, and we're headed that direction now. Again, in the illustration, methane deposits on the seafloor, ocean heats, methane uh, surfaces. This also acidifies the ocean, also contributes to the fish die-offs, of which we've seen dozens around the globe this month alone. This is another, this is a chart on atmospheric methane. You see from 1951 to 1980, the chart on your right, and we see as of even November 10, and it's much worse now even, you see how much more dark color you have. Methane is saturating the atmosphere at, at absolutely unprecedented speed right now. Uh, this is a headline from about three weeks ago. Didn't get much airtime on public media, which should be of interest to people. CNN gave this story 15 seconds, and then they went on to 10 minutes of Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. So they have 10 minutes for that, but they only have 15 seconds to say, oh, by the way, we're locked into at least 15 feet of sea level rise. 80 of the world's top 100 cities, or largest 100 cities, are now virtually doomed. So again, it shows the media has moved away from trying to pronounce global warming and simply to try to hide it. That helps to sell geoengineering, helps to keep the populations calm so that they're not worried about their Florida McMansion on the coast going underwater. Uh, that's where we're headed. There's no question about that. It's already a problem in many island nations around the globe. HARP, and this is, we have a lot of stories from the government trying to downplay the use of these installations. If they're not using them, why are they still building so many? In fact, we just see, in, there's protests in Japan right now because in Kyoto, Japan, the U.S. military is installing a base with another SBX radar system, which we believe is a part of the overall global network of these systems to help manipulate weather. This is happening right now in Kyoto. So clearly they're using these installations because they keep building them. Now, this is on radar. We see this a lot. In fact, if you see on Weather Channel, a lot of times the big donuts will pop up, and those are our, our radar readings, but we see a lot of this when there appears to be weather manipulation going on. These RF transmitters are all around the planet. So again, if, if they are not used with weather modification, why are there so many? Why do we see them so often? Why do we see the sort of signature that we would expect if they are using these? I mean, the, the sort of cloud alignment that we see often. Another film of RF frequency. And these, these, these sorts of weather manipulation techniques are named in patents. So again, uh, when we have dots that connect perfectly, why would we think this is not going on? This is a network of the ionosphere heaters around the globe. You see quite a network of them. And we know from statistical data that, and military publications that they can heat the ionosphere to, in some cases, tens of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit over areas of four or five hundred square miles. The ionosphere is electrically charged. When it's hit with that much power, it causes a chain reaction. So. Again, the, the things that are going on in the atmosphere for experimentation are quite lethal. Project Lucy, this is where the insanity gets worse. As the methane is releasing, geoengineering, when you aerosolize the atmosphere, it changes upper level wind currents. That, in turn, can affect ocean currents. Now we have warm water pumping straight into the Arctic up the North Atlantic. Now the methane releases I mentioned. Project Lucy is, again, we're told a proposal, just like we're told climate engineering is a proposal, even though we see it with our own eyes. This is to use these ionosphere heaters to try to blast the atmosphere with opposing frequencies in an attempt to degrade the methane, also with unknown results. So it, it, the insanity goes from bad to worse uh, as the equation goes along. How to cool the planet, geoengineering, and the audacious quest to fix Earth climate. How far has technology brought us so far? We're, we're virtually off the cliff toward global extinction. So are we to continue to have faith in this sort of technology with people who pretend that this isn't going on already, which is most of academia? This is a satellite photo. I was, I was in the lieutenant governor's office about two months ago with Gavin and his aide. And you know, I sh showed him a stack of images like this where you can clearly see the entire eastern Pacific is grid pattern sprayed. We know the science behind aerosolizing the atmosphere. Again, it diminishes and disperses precipitation. And, and, and this is the goal of climate engineering, to create a, an artificial marine layer. 
to try to shade the oceans. The oceans are warming exponentially fast. A cubic meter of seawater contains 4,000 times the thermal energy of a cubic meter of air. Once the water is warm, there's no turning it off. And that's happening. So we see this grid pattern. We know we're not getting any rain in California. And you know what? We have yet to see any, any action from any agency, let alone any politician. Clouds caused by aircraft exhaust may warm the U.S. climate. Now here's where the equation gets very interesting. So here's geoengineering that's we're told is to cool the planet, and indeed they can create large cooled zones, but we know the overall effect is a worsened warming. And we know putting particulates in the atmosphere shreds ozone. We know that. It doesn't matter if it's a volcano or a jet aircraft. So here you have NASA admitting it's causing, it's, it's fueling the warming, and yet we see the, the spraying increasing around the globe. Engineered snowstorms, what are they spraying? Now, this is where a lot of people's ability to comprehend this becomes strained. Can they engineer an artificial snowstorm? We know they can. The Chinese media openly announced it. The Chinese government openly announced it. That they were creating snowstorms. Anybody can Google this. Chinese scientists create artificial snowstorms. Google it and see what you find. When they created a, th a third round of these artificial snowstorms over Beijing, they did a billion dollars worth of damage. The population wasn't too thrilled about it. And so the government more or less uh, went under the radar with it. But in this particular article, which anybody can Google, I have two lab tests where you can see the result of putting biological ice nucleating agents in a beaker. It freezes it instantly. Same with uh, barium hydroxide and ammonium, same result. And we know, we've tested a lot of snow samples, and we see that we have, in fact, those materials, barium, in, in our snow samples in copious amounts. Anybody who saw the, the ice balls in Lake Michigan, Google that one, 75-pound ice balls, only in the last three years, also appears to be a result of these programs. Methane, again, gassing from, it's gassing all over the globe. I mean, we're, we're, we're hearing about methane deposits that we didn't even know about uh, because now it, it's gassing out again. That's another sign of the warming. Methane hydrate does not release from a cooling planet, but only from a warming planet. This is, this is a very recent map. This is, uh, there we go, May 16th. You see the darker oranges and reds there. That's a sign of much, much warmer water, much warmer than the normal or the average. So there's no question about the warming, period. Fish die-offs, many of you may have heard, again, as I mentioned earlier, in the last 30 days alone, there's been dozens around the globe. Authorities, again, claiming not to have any idea what's going on. But this is exactly what we'd expect from gassing from the subsea surface, where you have methane hydrate and even uh, hydrogen sulfide. You create anoxic zones, zones where there's no oxygen at all. And that's the only thing that can really kill that many fish that quickly, short of some massive chemical contamination, which I think they would have a hard time hiding. It wouldn't be uniform around the globe. And we know this gassing is occurring, period. Dead zones around the ocean. Oceans are dying. There's no question about that. And right now, we have about 400 plus dead zones around the planet. These are anoxic zones where nothing lives, no oxygen. Some of these dead zones are as big as 10,000 square miles. You don't hear media talking about this. We just had the anchovy fleet on the west coast return again with virtually nothing. We have seabirds now dying as of three days ago. Uh, we have uh, sea mammals washing up all along the U.S. west coast as well. Species extinction loss. This is a recent chart, but you see that trajectory pretty clear, about a 90 degree turn. So again, as I stress, we're losing 200 plus species of plant and animal a day. That's some 10,000, or excuse me, 10,000 times background extinction rates. Geoengineering is destroying the ozone layer. We knew the UV was high, and we, did, we, we know from geoengineering data that any particulate in the atmosphere, whether it's from a volcano or the back of a jet, it, it affects ozone. When we started metering for this, and we, we have state-of-the-art meters, we're getting UVB levels that are 1,200% higher than we're being told. We're told by all major agencies UVB is no more than 5% of total incoming UV. We know now we're getting at least 60% UVB. UVB has horrific effects on plants, plankton, us, and everything in between. So there is no question this is indicative of a shredded ozone layer, and there's no question the UV is that high. How long can they hide it? I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, at this point, when you're seeing the bark burn off of trees, and we're seeing that everywhere, UV is off the scale. Now, this is a, a chart that shows what geoengineering would be projected to do. You see the big temperature drops. But this is erroneous in the sense that we know geoengineering is going on. We know we have global dimming at some 20 to 25 percent. That means 20 to 25 percent of the sun's direct rays are no longer reaching the surface of the planet. 
We're not getting any cooler, so clearly the notion that this could work is clearly already proven wrong. And we have uh, geoengineers like David Keith, 10 years ago, or excuse me, in 2010, stated on the record, I was at the conference, it's on film, it's on record, where he stated we needed to put 20 million tons of aluminum nanoparticulates in the atmosphere every year. And by the time he gets to Stephen Colbert some months back, now he's down to 20,000 tons. There's no truth to anything a lot of these people say. So they're just simply out there to try to test the water, to, to test public opinion. If, if one figure seems too high, let's just change it to something else. I mean, I mean, the amount of lies we're being fed right now are absolutely off the charts. Okay, again, this is NASA GISS map. Look closely where it's cold. Now, does that look natural to you that you'd have one cold patch where we know some of the heaviest geoengineering is occurring, the eastern North American continent, while you see Siberia is in total meltdown? And Siberia is in total meltdown. It started burning there in April this year, early April. Siberia is normally frozen until mid-June. So why is it so cold in one spot right there? And, and if you look, we have the west frying. We have the high-pressure dome over the west. The jet stream was continually fed up through Alaska. Alaska had its warmest January on record. They didn't even have enough snow for the Iditarod dog sled race. So we see climate manipulation. You, you can't hamper the system without doing a hell of a lot of damage. That's what we see. Again, uh, grid patterns. I, anybody who thinks this is normal, it's astounding to me that this can be explained away by so-called agency people who are telling us this is condensation trails and we have films proving it's not. So at this point, uh, it, it, the scenario we live in where the, those that are supposed to protect us are simply towing a line for the power structure, it, it's a very sad state of affairs. Project Paperclip, I don't know how many have heard of this. This is a historical fact. The Nazi scientists were divided up between the US and the Soviet Union because our military did not want to lose that level of genius, however twisted it may have been. So the bottom line is, this is historical facts. Uh, a great deal of the, so of the uh, Nazi scientists were brought here and put right back to work, historical fact. And part of this relates to weather modification as well. Proof of U.S. military biological tests on innocent U.S. civilians. This is historical fact. Look it up. I don't want anybody to believe anything I'm saying. Look it up. We know this is fact. We have our own, our own troops. For example, in the Gulf, uh, Gulf War I, depleted uranium used our own soldiers. We have 180,000 sick with Gulf War syndrome. Those in the Pentagon don't give a damn about who they contaminate. I, I mean, at, at what point do we wake up and, and realize this is the case as we all live under a toxic cloud? You know, I'm not much on theater. But this fits. This truly fits. And you know, and that's, that's the kind of person that we have there that, uh, and he's typical for what we see in the, the Pentagon. And, and uh, this is, this is uh, an image that stays with you. The allergy epidemic by 2015, half of US may be carrying one of these. Every other commercial, asthma, uh, COPD, uh, we know we have NOAA admitting that uh, in the last 10 years we have an atmosphere that's now full of particulates and they can't identify where they're all coming from? Doesn't that hit anybody as uh, astounding that, that they would have no clue? And the bottom line is we are breathing this stuff and why doesn't air quality detect it? Because the particles according to geoengineering patents and accord, it, it matches our testing. I, tr I paid a lot of money for some tests to try to test down to 0.1 microns, which is much smaller than what air quality tests for. Still couldn't sift out any particulates from a sample we knew had aluminum in it. And if they are nanoparticulates of the size of the patent state, none of the air quality equipment, to my knowledge, will detect it when they're looking for, at best, 2.5 microns. So it goes under the radar, and we continue to breathe it, and the smaller the particle, the more harmful it is to the human organism. Now, this is astounding. Planning for your future care. This, this, this is sent to us from UK. This is for a cancer care planning guide. What a, what a nice sky in the background of, of spray trails. So, you know, we see it in kids' films. We see it in advertisements. It's just conditioning, period. Resource wars. This is important to remember because it's, it's all connected. Everything's connected. What we see happening in Ukraine, what we saw happening in Iraq, this is all about resources, period. If, if Iraq's export was carrots, I don't think we would have gone. And, and the bottom line is this is ramping up very, very quickly. We have uh, peak oil was probably passed in 2006. Fracking is an absolutely false hope. It's destroying the groundwater. It's a, it's a very short-lived uh, gain for a, for a forever loss. So resource wars are happening now, and it's going to escalate very quickly. 
Former BP geologist, peak oil is here again. It appears it happened in, in 2006. And what happens if anybody's ever heard of Hubert, Hubert's Peak? In, uh, in the 50s, a scientist predicted that the U.S. would hit peak oil about, about 72, I believe. He was laughed out of the industry, and he was right. And that's what we have here. When we have an industry that wants to only uh, see what they want to see, someone telling the truth doesn't get very far. How about per capita availability of food grains declines in the last decade? It's not getting better, it's getting worse fast. Kansas wheat, Kansas wheat harvests, I think, are going to be about half. You drive them down the I-5 cor I corridor, as I just did, you see dead trees all over. The dead branches sticking out, trees are dropping foliage. Yes, the drought's a factor. Yes, the bioavailable metals in the rain is a factor, and there's no question they're there. We've done 70 lab tests in Shasta County. There's no question. Aluminum, barium, strontium, those metals are in the rain. That's an effect. And we have UV that's off the charts, and that's one of the biggest effects with the trees dropping foliage. They can't take the intense UV, period. Right beneath your feet, the hidden reality of deep underground military bases. Again, fact. And we, we would have so many people in our society that would say, they just, they write all this off. It's conspiracy theory. Everything's, they're, they're like Pavlov's dogs, just simply trained to react. When someone says something that threatens the official narrative, uh, your, your friends, you're out there. This is going on right now, period. The military's digging. We called Mountain House Foods uh, two years ago and talked to some of the management when they weren't selling retail for a while because guess who was buying it all? The U.S. military. They're stocking up for something, and, and clearly this is going on. Underground, it's, it's again, dumb is the acronym, Deep Underground Military Base. Look it up. The, the, these are real. The acronym fits. It certainly fits. What's it called? Dumb. Deep, they're called dumbs, deep underground military bases. So there we have one entrance. There we have another entrance. There we have an actual military insignia on, on one. Uh, they call these moles. These giant tunnel boring machines are called moles. Now, the paradox is, again, they can dig as deep a hole as they want. If we continue to do what we're doing to the planet, it's game over. It's game over. We have previous events like the Petum event, Paleocene, Eocene Thermal Maximum, 55 million years ago, methane mass expulsion. With methane reservoirs that were thought to be not as large as what's releasing right now in the LAPTEP C, which may be as much as 10,000 gigatons. If one half of 1%, try to, try to get your arms around this, one half of 1% of that 10,000 gigatons releases, that would be a 400% increase on the total greenhouse gas effect because of methane's intense warming characteristics. So that puts it into perspective. There's enough methane in the Arctic alone to exterminate life on Earth perhaps dozens of times over, and you can't live in a hole for that long. Their equilibrium periods after the Petum event were 10 to 20 million years. So uh, at, at this point, I, I believe the power structure thought they could manipulate the weather indefinitely without consequence, which is what psychopathic people think, and now that uh, the ship's going down, they appear to be just trying to mire populations in, in uh, weather catastrophes and confusing events that confuse people, whether it's cooling or warming, and just simply trying to, to uh, keep certain things out of the, the public consciousness for as long as possible. Another, you see the size of some of these moles. Again, that's what they're called, moles. Now, you, you look at the size of that. It's astoundingly large. It's, it, it looks like something out of a science fiction movie, but this is the kind of things that, that, that's going on that most people have not seen or have no idea is happening. No idea. An EMP attack, the weapon that could end life as we know it. Again, one more reason that perhaps they're going underground. So we have Fukushima going on right now. We all know that. We have, I, I believe there's about 400 nuclear facilities around the globe. I think there's a total of nearly 1,000 reactors because some facilities have more than one. So. As we shred the ozone layer, and there's no question it's shredded, we have a massive northern hemisphere hole. If you look it up, you'll find the research data. You'll find that Canadian media covered that their government was threatening their scientists on the ozone uh, monitoring programs with termination if they spoke to media. So you have you know, this very open campaign of muzzling scientists. If we don't have enough natural protection and we have an EMP, electromagnetic pulse attack, that can shut down grids around the, the globe. If grids shut down, nuclear plants can't cool themselves. Now we have Fukushima times who knows how many. So that makes us vulnerable uh, in one aspect. Now, let's, after an EMP comes nuclear meltdown. Again, this is, this is no secret. Our media certainly doesn't talk about it. And, and this, this gives an idea of the level of insanity we face. We have three reactors in China syndrome right now. 
in Fukushima. Three, there's no question they have no technology to fix it. They have no idea how to deal with it. And, the, and there may be, uh, we're getting news, I, I was on the phone to South America last night with General Bert Stubblebine, his wife. Uh, he's, he's the highest ranking U.S. Uh, general to speak out about 9-11. And they're getting news from their sources from Fukushima that the, the Reactor 4 fuel pool may, be, may have had a fire. Uh, let's hope that's not the case because that would be um, cataclysmic beyond imagination. But, but the bottom line is, with all this going on, what do we have Obama doing? authorizing $6.5 billion to build some more nuke plants in Georgia. Now, if that doesn't make clear that there is no sanity in this equation, I don't know what does. Earth narrowly misses having a power grid wiped out by massive solar flare, a CME, coronal mass ejection. If we have a Kerrigan event now with the ozone layer that's shredded in a, in a horribly dilapidated grid system, again, grid shut down, nuke plants can't cool, game over. So. How much sense does it make to continue spraying an atmosphere? And this is one of the excuses they give for the climate engineering, to provide a shield from a CME, while at the same time shredding our natural protection. So why don't we all just yank our teeth out and put some false teeth in, because maybe that's better. If we have natural protection, why wouldn't we use that? Why wouldn't we keep that? And we halt the Earth's hydrological cycle, uh, destroy the ozone layer, toxify the soils with these programs. How much sense does that make? Solar flare could unleash nuclear holocaust across planet Earth. Again, I'm not making this stuff up. There's plenty in the scientific community discussing this. They know it's real, but they cannot get any media attention, period. Global geoengineering fueling Venus syndrome. Again, I, I encourage people to look this up. Venus syndrome is not a metaphor. It's the track we are actually on. And the difference is when you hear scientists like James Hansen talk about this from NASA, and he's, he's recognized around the globe, but he's not really telling it as it is. Because the IPCC, the largest scientific panel on any subject in human history, does not include feedback loops in their climate modeling. How can that be? How, how can they not include some of the biggest factors of all, which makes all their climate modeling virtually useless? It's useless. It's pointless. This is not a linear equation. It, it, it's, it's like uh, someone saying, oh, if you jump off a 200-foot cliff and you fall so far in the first foot, you're going to keep falling at that rate for the whole 200 feet. That's not how it works. You pick up momentum rapidly. If you look at Venus syndrome, bottom line is you'll find a lot of data that that is the track we are on. That's a runaway greenhouse effect where our planet ends up looking like Venus. And Venus, by the way, isn't 900 degrees on the ground because it's closer to the sun. It's because it had a runaway greenhouse effect. And it's, its atmosphere is 100 times more dense than ours. Venus was thought now to have oceans. And all things being equal, Venus would be about 25 degrees warmer because of its proximity to the sun, not 900 degrees. The premise with geoengineering, to increase the Earth's albedo, or the reflectivity. If, there was, if that's the only factor with life, Venus would have life. But Venus doesn't have life. Venus's albedo is two and a half times the albedo of Earth. It's two and a half times more reflective. That's why it's so bright in the sky. But obviously, no life there. So that's the short-sightedness of the climate engineering again. There we go. That's about how it is. Again, a sky full of trails, and that's about the society we live in. You know, and I, I, I just, at this point, the amount of people that um, would rather have a Big Mac and go watch a football game, all hell's breaking loose, I can't do it. How do we look at our children and do this? How do we look at ourselves in the mirror? The further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. I, I had to put this up because it's the case. And anybody of you that have ever tried to share this issue or anything else that's not comfortable for people, you know what it's like. You know what it's like when people roll their eyes and they go into their little comfort zone and they try to ridicule you for having the courage to try to, to, to share something that matters. Life has to be about something, doesn't it? I mean, if we're not here for the common good, what the hell are we here for? To watch American Idol? I, I mean, at this point, uh, there has to be a purpose in it all. Now, when it comes to courage, and I, 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 re I remember this image the day it came out because that was so touching for me that I'm sure that man's probably dead. No, I'm sure it happened right afterward. But, but that's when a person comes to a point in their life when they know to preserve some semblance of honor and sanity means more than anything else, means more than anything. And when I see images like that, that's the sort of thing that just inspires us all. That if, if that man has the courage to face what he faced, all of us can have the courage no matter what sort of ridicule we get for the moment. And it won't be long. The ridicule won't last long because there are things that can't be hidden much longer. So those who have chosen to deny this issue will have to face it. But if that man can do that, I know I can go out and do this every day for the rest of my life. Again, a Palestinian boy throwing rocks at an Israeli tank. Same kind of courage. 
I saw a film, and this film is available online, and I'm not faulting all Israelis, but I am faulting their government. I saw a film of five Israeli soldiers holding a boy just like that, five of them, turned his elbow. You can find this online. It's on a film called Peace Propaganda in the Promised Land, turning his elbow upright and, and raining about a 50-pound rock down on it, shattering his elbow backwards because he threw a rock at their tank. So, you know, this is the kind of world we live in, but the bottom line is these images to me inspire courage, absolute courage. Why did the Census Bureau award a $500 million contract to Lockheed Martin Corporation to, to GPS every single one of our homes? Now, why, why did they do that? We should really ask ourselves that question. I couldn't find out why, and I tried. I tried the Census Bureau, couldn't find out. They hiked into my location twice to make sure they had my front door GPSed. Now, why would they need that? Many people don't even know this was done. Now, and why was a defense industry contractor doing this? I would argue this. We are perilously close to a total collapse of society. Our society is so incredibly finely balanced, and we have sacked the planet for resources, and when it comes, it's going to come fast and furious, and the power structure is preparing for that. They're absolutely preparing. And if you GPS everybody's doorstep, there must be a reason, right? How about drones? Is that perhaps a way for a few people to control many? When, when you feel that you, you're not safe inside your own home, that you're, you've been GPSed, and this was done. This is not speculation, it was done. Do I know this is the reason they GPS? No, I don't know, but it sure as hell fits. It sure, it, it sure absolutely fits. So, and this fits as well. Now, now, why, there's a question on top. Why the hell is the Department of Agriculture buying submachine guns? Now, this was right on the USDA site. And we know Homeland Security, this is historical fact. They have purchased 2.2 billion rounds of 40 caliber hollow point ammunition. It's about six and a half rounds for every single person in the continental US. Why would they need 2.2 billion rounds? And 40 caliber matches what the USDA just um, authorized for those offices that, that chose to pursue this to buy submachine guns and you can look this is on their site we have the film capture from the USDA site this is about three weeks old understanding denial as a defense mechanism we live in a society that is totally immersed in denial from so many directions our society modern society you hear people talk economists talk about such and such in 2040 and 2050 and it sort of sets a mindset that everything will somehow magically keep chugging along industrialized society is like a snake eating its own tail. And we published an article a while back, sh uh, about a month ago, showing the car lots around the globe that have literally hundreds of thousands of unpurchased new cars, and they are keeping the manufacturers going because that's the only thing keeping the whole facade going. They are, GM is literally, there's record of them buying their own cars, same with BMW, same with other companies, to keep their numbers up. A snake eating its own tail. That's what's happening right now. You have the Baltic, dry index, all global shipping. It's, it's in the basement. This is all the shipping containers, everything from everywhere to everywhere. It's not shipping. It's not happening. The only thing keeping anything afloat is printed Fed fiat money. It's all a facade. And people ask, where does the money come from this, for the, these climate programs? Where does it come from? It's from the central bankers. Where does it all come from? Why are the wars in Iraq happening and, and, and now Libya and then Syria and then Iran? Because the U.S. has to have the dollar for the global reserve currency or they can't print whatever the empire needs. And once the dollar is no longer the global reserve currency, the empire comes down. And it's happening now. And that I would argue that makes the power structure that much more dangerous. So we see right now in the last few weeks, again, there's, the climate is spinning horribly out of control right now. The climate engineering is making a bad situation worse. And the power structure, again, for all these types of programs, if the dollar is not the global reserve currency, game over. But our society is totally in denial, and I would argue that's going to end soon, like it or not. Heads are going to get ripped out of the sand because there'll be no hiding from what's coming. How the PhDs have wrecked the world. Now, I stood, I have, two months ago, I was in a forest in Shasta County with USDA scientists and congressional reps looking at a whole ridge of dead trees. And I asked the USDA rep if he saw any forest decline there. And without really flinching, he looked at me and said, no, he didn't see any problem. You know, and that, that kind of uh, blatant, arrogant, uh, completely unjustifiable lying is astounding to me. It's astounding. I've been in the field with other USDA soil scientists taking soil pH tests, coming up with values 
20 times higher than the historical norm because we had the USDA baselines with us. And they sheepishly look at me and say, what do you want us to do about it? Well, how about doing your job? How about public disclosure? We're seeing pH values in Shasta County routinely 10, 12 times above normal. Our normally acidic soils, 5, 4, 5, 6, are now 6, 6. That's a magnitude of 10. It's like a Richter scale. So we're seeing aquatic insect life decline as measured by a U.S. Forest Service biologist in Siskiyou County in 10 years, seen a 90% decline, 90, a virtual crash. So the walls are closing in much faster than people realize. And, and, and we have a lot of people with PhDs, and this is an article we posted on Geoengineering Watch, who simply toe the line, who simply do what they're told. And I spoke to a Forest Service biologist about a month ago and asked her if they were monitoring the forest decline. She says, we don't see any decline. My dad was an arborist. I know trees. And there's no question the trees are declining. There's, there's study on it around the globe. Boreal forest in Alaska declined 30%, 30% mortality. So it's just simply lying. Will humans go extinct soon on the path we're on? Absolutely no question. If, if there's not a major change in direction, no question. In fact, you have scientists like Guy McPherson from, he's a, a professor emeritus from UC Arizona. I know Guy. He's part of the AMIG group. His data is very solid. Guy gives us, he gives life in the northern hemisphere 17 years. That doesn't mean everything's fine till then. It means nothing's left by that point in time. Now, will he be right? I, I don't know. I can't say. But I can say this. So far, his data has been more accurate than anyone else's. And when you have the feedback mechanisms kicking into place, like the methane right now, I, I mean, this is a, an equation that is not on any of the other modeling. So do I, do I know the guy's data is correct? Again, no, I don't. But I know this. If the best chance we would have is to stop hampering Earth's life support systems, period. Extinction is the rule, survival is the exception. This is, a, this is from Carl Sagan, and, and, and this is a fact, too. People have been trained to magically think that uh, nothing can ever really go bad, and especially here in America, everything's always somewhere else. It's not happening to us or in our backyard. Not reality. The chickens are coming home to roost fast. Now, th this is, again, I'm not usually much on theater, but this is an inevitability. Th these things we've been taught to, to think are only Hollywood. Infrastructure's falling apart. Why aren't they repairing infrastructures? Anybody wonder that? They're not doing much to really do that because they know, they know that there's a lot bigger fish to fry. They know that what's coming is going to make all that a moot point. I mean, the fossil fuel paradigm alone is coming to an end by the day. So I, I would rather have this and still have a planet that supported life. I don't care about this sort of modern civilization. I'd rather have a planet that supports life still so my children have a future, so the children of the globe have a future. So I don't need civilization per se. But I do need a planet that, that lives. Now, this, again, uh, this is the sort of skies we live under. And for me, this is, life like this is intolerable. It's intolerable to live under a toxic cloud every day. And there's no question this metal's coming down on us. This has been our point with air quality people who want to argue contrails, chemtrails, and all, all this. Their job, if there's a contamination that's indisputable, and there is, is to disclose that, at least at minimum to disclose that. And we know there's a contamination. We've had snow samples off the side of Mount Shasta as measured by a Forest Service biologist with 61,000 parts per billion of aluminum. That never touched the surface of the ground, so they can't, they can't equate that to some soil contamination. I've had rain, single rain events with 3,450 parts per billion of aluminum. Highly toxic. That's, a, that's almost a 50,000% increase in a five-year period. So the bottom line is um, this is not natural at all. And this is exactly what climate engineering describes. We know the material is falling on us. And, and if, we, if we continue to live under a toxic cloud, our days will be numbered. Now this, again, I, I, I'm not much into theater, but this is what a lot of people see. When, when you tell them things that they don't want to hear, that's what they see. And it's all too depressing. And they go about their way. But you can, you can think of things like this as well. And I, I will never give up, ever. So long as there's a single tree standing, a single frog croaking, I will never give up. And if all of us remembered this and that we have, we have a part in this play, and if we all work together, if we truly brought this to light, if we could do that, I would argue it's the single greatest shockwave we could cause around the globe. The geoengineering subject crosses all party lines, religious beliefs. No one wants to be sprayed like a rat. And if you make every single day your goal to move the ball forward, what can you do from your own home computer? You don't need to go to meetings or presentations. From your own home computer, we have on Geoengineering Watch links that 
help you do this. It's one's activist suggestions and one's called Flaming Arrows. And the Flaming Arrow link, it's all prepared, a very thought out letter, the proper links that you can send out to groups, organizations, individuals that would care if they knew. And even if they don't acknowledge it at the moment, even if they reject it, they'll still know of the issue. And as the walls close in, and I promise you they're closing in fast, those seeds will sprout. So if all of us were launching flaming arrows, and we got others to launch these flaming arrows, and we held people accountable, when people in agencies want to blow this off as if they'll always go to the word chemtrails. Oh, we have a little NASA document that says chemtrails is a hoax. One, I'm not talking about chemtrails. The media always uses that term. We're talking about geoengineering, SAG, stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, SRM, solar radiation management, mountains of science, mountains. So you have to know the right terms, and you don't let them off the hook. And we have a site called Disinformation Directory right now to expose those people and agencies who are choosing to simply not investigate and lie and stay in their bubble. We're going to expose them. We're going to put their public emails out as well. Climate Engineering 101, this is off our site. So again, anybody who thinks that guy is normal is just simply living in an alternate universe. This is another tool. This is an important tool. This is a friend named George Barnes. He's a filmmaker who learned of this issue, never been an activist, but he decided he had to join the fight. This is an interactive app. There's an award-winning documentary at this app. You can watch in entirety. The app was just updated, uh, very uh, technically advanced now. You can, wherever you're at, you can photograph the sky, and it will automatically send it out to your legislatures in your area. The film was narrated by William Baldwin. It's won about a dozen awards so far. Great tool uh, and, and great one to share with with others. This is our site again, and this is our purpose, and it will remain my purpose until my last breath or until we have clean skies. Can't, I, I, I can't imagine a world this way indefinitely, and it won't go on this way. So the bottom line is no matter how dark the horizon looks, it's not black yet. And if all of us pull together, if all of us united, and instead of living in despair, made every day an effort to move the ball forward, even with the few of us that are here, and we increased our numbers. Uh, the equation I always point out to people, if you introduce a subject to two people at the beginning of a 30-day month, effectively, with the flyers, the tools we have, and they two each the next day, and that carried on for 30 days, that's five and a half million. And my math is correct on that, as, as astounding as that seems. So if we all pull together, and we are gaining ground, by the way, uh, globally, the amount of people that are now getting onto this issue is, is increasing radically. We have Italian senators uh, demanding disclosure. We have headlines in Malta. We have Swedish uh, citizens suing their government. Um, I've, I've met recently with the head of one of the largest environmental consulting firms on the planet. They know this is going on. So, you know, they're trying to put their uh, ducks in a row, if you will, before they address this issue. But if we could bring this to light, it would be the single greatest leap we could take in the right direction. So my gratitude to all of you who came. I hope we all pull together and uh, not in despair, but in in uh, the concerted effort to bring this issue to light. Thank you very much.